Hello everyone, welcome to another session of the Global Forces Summit. This year is organized by the APF, the Association of Professional Futurists, the World Future Review and Path Forward. Um, we are very happy because we have now for this session Wendy Schultz. She is one of the most respected futurists with over 40 years of global foresight practice. She's the director of Infinite Futures and Futures Puzzle Master at Dixau Foresight. Uh, and she's going to talk about is cows turtles all the way down. Wendy, welcome to the World Forces Summit. Thank you very much. Hello, world. Hello, lovely people. I'm delighted to be able to share some thoughts with you this afternoon. I must warn you, however, these thoughts are a bit of a sketch, a rough sketch of an essay that I've been writing. So some parts may be a bit more of a bumpy ride than other parts. But let's get started. So it's chaos turtles all the way down, also known as teacups versus the age of murmurations. So first, a little personal background. Um, as some of you know, I got my graduate degree. I did my graduate work and got my PhD at the Futures Program at the University of Hawaii, where Jim Dater was leading the Hawaii Research Center for Future Studies. And Part of what became my fascination that turned into my dissertation was an interest on images of the future, specifically visions of preferred future, how that connected to leadership, how that connected to the idea of empowering everyone so each of us think of ourselves as a visionary leadership leader, and then also mixing sort of Pollock, uh, Fred Pollock and the image of the future and its focus on preferred futures and positive futures with a little bit of scientific watershed. The other key reading that uh, sort of matched up with that was Ilya Prigogine and the concept that was, was then being discussed a lot of complexity, complex adaptive systems and chaos and what that all means. And so really this presentation has its deep roots in those fascinations, vision, leadership, complexity, and chaos. Now, the subtitle, Teacups versus the Age of Murmurations. What on earth does that mean? All right, teacups. It's about the tension that many people are expressing in futures uh, work and practice and theory between taking a sort of goals, gaps, and actions approach or saying change and our futures are all emergence all the time. Now, what is this about teacups? All right, I teach the systems thinking course uh, in the graduate program at the University of Houston. And as part of systems thinking, we learn how to map causal loops, dynamics of change visualized. And one of those dynamics is the balancing loop, balancing interrelationships. And there happen to be two ways that you can map it. One is as a plain loop um, and the other way specifically says you have a goal. You look at the goal, you look at the current state of play, and there's a gap. And because of that gap, you're prompted or you're inspired to take an action that will change the current state to get it closer to that goal. And as it so happens, the way you map that, there's a, there's a little bit of a handle sticking off the loop where you put the goal. And just as a shortcut, as my students know, we came to call this the teacup model. So the teacup model is very straightforward and instrumental, and it assumes that it's simple to create change. We know what we want. We know that the current state isn't anywhere near what we want. There's a gap there, and so we're going to take actions. And that will improve the current state, close the gap, and let us reach our desired goal. 
Well, rightfully, a lot of people are critiquing that approach because nothing is ever that simple. And in fact, how change happens is much more like a starling murmuration, right? One of these beautiful flowing patterns where each of the birds in the flock is constantly adjusting its position relative to the other birds in the flock to maintain warmth and to maintain safety, relative safety from predators that might attack it. Now, what's interesting about this beautiful sort of flowing ballet in the sky that is a marvel of complex adaptive systems is that it takes place in a context of turbulence or chaos because airflow is turbulence. So those murmurations, that wonderful complex adaptive flight dance in the air is happening on a backdrop or in a context of turbulence. So one of the things that we think about are complex adaptive systems, and all of us individually are complex adaptive systems. Our, um, our societies, our communities, our organizations are complex adaptive systems. We're all trying to sort of manage um, how we move forward into the future, and we do that by creating sort of rules of the game, rules of play that help us um, deal with situations that we've seen before. We learn about the way change is unfolding and we learn about different patterns of cause and effect and learn to sort of interpret causality in what's happening around us. And when, we, when there are, don't seem to be any rules of cause and effect at all, we learn to respond to chaos in a variety of ways. So why, is, why am I calling this chaos turtles all the way down? So yes, it's true. I'm about to start talking about futures cones. In the context of this story, a well-known scientist once gave a public lecture on astronomy. He described how the Earth orbits around the sun and how the sun in turn orbits around the center of a vast collection of stars called our galaxy. At the end of the lecture, a little old lady at the back of the room got up and said, what you have told us is rubbish. The world is really a flat plate supported on the back of a giant tortoise. The scientist, clearly on top of his logical thinking, gave a superior smile before replying, right, so what is the tortoise standing on? You're a very clever young man, very clever, said the old lady, but it's turtles all the way down. So what I want to talk about is how we manage both the paths, the multiple and um, diverse paths that play into this ever moving moment of the present and how those unfold until into multiple diverse futures. So the other point I should say is that the plate of our present is not a flat plate, it's a very warped plate. There are people on the hills, there are people in the valleys, there are change that's difficult and change that's easy. But what does that warped plate of the present intersect? It intersects phase spaces of the past and our futures. What does that mean? Let's talk about the futures cone. I'm going to take you through a, a little linear tour of a history of futures cones. This futures cone was developed off of sort of the original futures cone by Charles Taylor in the 1990s. This ancient futures cone and it, was, it took a bit of archaeology for me to dig it out of my files, is actually from my PhD dissertation in 1995. And I think of it as the perfume of time because I think of sort of the perfume of, of multiple pasts being pushed through the atomizer of the present and kind of creating a cloud of possible futures that are alternatively possible, plausible, probable, and the personal preferred because preferred futures are always subjective until we start talking to each other. Now, people have you know, up, been updating the futures cone and, and the, the uh, community of future studies has been talking about the various updates. This is a very good one by Joseph Voros and he gives us in his article about it a complete history, so that's also useful. He expands it to include not just the possible, the plausible, the probable, and the preferable, but the projected future, and the preposterous. So that's useful, but he kind of leaves out the past. Now, the other thing I want you to look at is all of the straight lines and neat boundaries of the circles in all of these futures cones. 
right? Here's an updated one from the University of Houston's um, Masters in Strategic Foresight. This is the framework foresight uh, sort of conceptual framework for doing future studies in foresight mapped out onto a cone. And again, this is 3D, but look at how tidy it is, right? All those neat lines and columns and heading off in one direction. Now, Epaminondas Christophilopoulos has just this year said, let's talk about futures cones in terms of space and time. And again, he brings back the past in a, in a much more even-handed way, same size as, uh, as the future in his visual map. But more importantly, although this is very straight line focused, when talking about the paths from the past into the futures, he introduces these wandering curves. And that's important. And why is it important? Because None of these straight lines should be here. None of these boundaries should be clean. What we actually work our way through daily is more of a dance between multiple, uh, multiple chaotic situations that then we work to bring back to the merely complex situation or complicated situations or clear situations to invoke Dave Snowden's Kinevin framework. So we're always moving back and forth between really chaos and even sometimes pure disorder and more orderly uh, conceptualizations and, and sense making about what we have experienced in the past, what lies in our past, and what might lie in our futures. So I am proposing the Chaos Turtles Futures Cone. It is literally chaos turtles all the way back and all the way forward. What actually are these? Now, please um, be kind. I am not a great graphic artist and I must admit I do not um, have mastery level skills in Adobe Illustrator. But the idea I was trying to get across was that at any given point in time, either in the past or the future, there are chaotic turbulent changes occurring. And turbulence being generated as a result even of straightforward decisions, things that we think are decisions for stability, create impacts that generate more turbulence. And cutting through that, of course, is that plane of the present, which is very bumpy. So how do we actually move through all the chaos of the past, through that boundary of the present and think forward into what could be chaotic futures? The Chaos Turtles Futures Cone is really filled with evolving attractors and paths of the dance of life challenged and adapting, facing different patterns of turbulence, people taking different adaptive paths, swirling forward through paths across the infinite boundary of the present. It is always the present. The present is always moving into the infinite possibilities of gently bounded attractors. What are attractors, you may be asking. Attractors are, in, uh, in chaos terms, they are the different patterns that emerge when you observe behaviors and outcomes over time. And after one or two iterations or one or two cases, it seems like the outcomes are completely random. But if you see a system that seems to be in complete disorder and you monitor it over a thousand iterations, you begin to see that while you can't predict exactly what the next iteration or next outcome of the system will be, you can say that it will happen within certain boundaries or parameters within the space of possible outcomes. And that's what a chaos pattern represents. So it's different out creatures is when faced with chaos, we take different adaptive steps. And so our path forward from the pasts into the futures is really much more of a dance and a circling around different uh, pools of chaos and different possibility spaces and our own ingenuity carrying us forward. Okay, you at this point are probably thinking, well, this is really conceptual. I'm not sure I signed up for this, for this particular presentation. 
Yeah. So what is this really about? Well, part of the issue, to get back to visioning for a second, is that visioning isn't about making a technocratic, cut and dried, um, you know, necessarily measurable goal statement, although that can happen. It's not about saying, if I know the goal and I know the current situation, I know exactly what I need to do to reach the goal. No, we know indicative things. What is it really about? Why do we really vision? Why is that important to get together and talk about what we want for the future and what our desirable futures are? Is because those images, those stories, the songs, the sense of the future, sense making are all about sharing narratives, sharing ideas, sharing images that help us align, that help us clarify our values and work together. We seek certainty. And we value stability, but both are constrained. So part of what we need to do as futures researchers and just as people alive working our way towards what we hope will be improved futures or improved potentials for the future is get used to surfing change, as Jim Dater always says, get used to adapting to uncertainty and really try to thrive on chaos. And it's about maintaining a dynamic balance between the chaotic and the purposeful, between the creativity that chaos can generate and the purposeful and orderly that basically helps us maintain our sanity in the midst of all this dynamic change. So what are the implications for making, baking, telling, smelling, and touching futures? Managing uncertainty may require wallowing it, not reducing it to two, the futures are not binary. So get used to the idea of falling off the edge of uncertainty's plane of doxa, the plane where there's both orthodoxy and heterodoxy and get beyond all of that doxa and dive into chaos. So bang the drums, hit the cymbals, drop stones in the waters, read the interference patterns, and then do it all over again. This is what I mean by interference patterns. Think of these as being generated by multiple changes. In this case, they were generated by drops of water hitting the surface of this pond. But change hits the surface of our daily lives, of our systems in very much the same way, sends out ripples and cascades of impacts that interconnect and interfere, create interference patterns. So specifically, methods. What are some of the methods we can use to engage in this dance between uh, complex adaptation and chaos. Learn to reverse assumptions. Learn to question everything. Toss stones of emerging change onto the systems of the present. That will require that you actually sit down and map out how you and all the people around you perceive some of the systems of the present. When you drop those stones of emerging change onto your system map, think about the futures um, that, the different futures that are generated by virtue of the impacts of change rippling throughout systems. Think about the way cascades of impacts that you can map via futures wheels link into larger evolving systems and emergent stories of very different disruptive transformative futures. So, there are actually at least three methods that I practice regularly that do that. All of them are based on futures wheels. So thank you, Jerry Glenn, for inventing the futures wheel all that long time ago. One is Manoa scenario building. One is an approach to visioning that um, is based in part on Manoa scenario building and adds in um, Three Horizons and a few other methods. I'm all for having a toolkit that you know so well that you feel comfortable mashing tools of futures thinking together in different ways. And another one is one that I'm working on right now that mashes up Manoa scenario building and futures wheels with the Harmon fan approach to scenario building. So what are these? Manoa scenario building literally attempts to build scenarios by virtue of um, creating a, a, a map of what happens when three or more changes happen at the same time, all generate impact cascades, and all of those impacts start connecting and colliding and interfering with each other in a way that creates a very turbulent 
picture of a possible emerging future. It will have um, upside components. It will have downside components. Parts will be wonderful. Parts will make you laugh. Parts will be observed. Parts will be horrible. Because in the real world, that's what real world life is like. We want to build scenarios that also reflect that. The Manoa-based visioning that the Center for Complex Systems in Transition created for their Good Anthropocene project basically said, let's start off with thinking through how the future might be a better place by using something like the Manoa approach. But instead of taking emerging issues that could be good or bad, let's focus on pilot projects that exist today in local communities where people are doing good work, demonstrably good work and say, what happens if everybody um, takes on those approaches to change in the community or to community gardening or to educating kids or to apprenticeships, whatever the change is, whatever the pilot project is, say that that approach is widespread all over the world. It's creating impacts um, and cascades of impacts. And what would a better future look like where all of that good work was happening and all of its impacts were spreading throughout daily life? And then they built it on top of Three Horizons approach as well. So interesting. What I'm gonna talk about is the Harmon fan. This is comes from the first chapter of Willis Harmon's An Incomplete Guide to the Future. And it basically says, Think about all the changes you've seen and the kinds of little mini stories, mini futures that might erupt and arrange them on a fan from the kinds of small changes, small futures that we might see immediately to the ones that might happen maybe 10 years out to the ones that might happen 15 years out and 20 years out. In this case, this was an example on the futures of universities. Now walk through, treat those little mini scenarios like stepping stones into the future and find a path where those stones connect in different ways to tell the story of how your future evolves and where it goes and what its components are, what it's made up of. Very interesting, very powerful. What if we also acknowledge that just like a dinosaur tromping along on the ground, everyone remembers Jurassic Park, right? Creating again, ripple patterns as it walks, what if we acknowledge that every single time we choose the sorts of actions that are embodied in each of these little mini scenarios, we're creating cascades of impacts, we're creating even more changes that might tell us which is the most likely next stepping stone to take, which might be the most disruptive. And so acknowledging that there are these swirls of impacts that are, that are um, created every single time we make a choice, we take one step into the future, then you have something that looks much more like this, with every single step forward creates another set of impact cascades moving forward. So just a thought, we're working on creating a workshop based on this. I'll let you know later how it plays out. So to close, contradict everything. Remember that plausibility is maladaptive. Don't get too focused on what you think can happen. Remember that the future always surprises us. Divine panic, literally being in, in, uh, inspired by the great god Pan, who was very creative and a little demented. Divine panic opens new paths and life flourishes on that boundary where order meets chaos. Now, turtles, Ekwensu is a, a trickster spirit embodying chaos and change. So one of the other things I would say is get to know your local trickster spirit, move beyond uncertainty and embrace chaos. And remember that tricksters could be benign and helpful spirits as well as, um, as well as practical jokers. So thank you. Um, wow, okay, sort of zooming ahead here. Hello to everyone. A talk on turtles, yes. And thank you for everyone telling me how, where you're coming from because all over the world, that's fantastic. Um, let me go down to the question on chaos uh, a second. Let's see. And yes, this would relate to the chaotic model. Um, 
sorry, down here there was some a question about chaos being negative. One of the interesting things that we have to talk about when we're um, discussing the um, discussing chaos and complexity and systems thinking in in my systems graduate seminar is the fact that systems thinking often uses ordinary words to mean very technical things. And chaos does have a negative connotation the way it's commonly used. In systems thinking, chaos is actually um, a form of loosely structured um, deterministic but nonlinear change. So it's not like true disorder. And true disorder is what people usually think of if you just ca casually say, well, life is so chaotic right now. Chaos is actually more, more, a more useful term than that. And, and we do need to, I think, um, um, rehabilitate it in people's minds to, to emphasize some of the creative and generative qualities that it brings to life and the world around us. Uh, let's see, stepping stones is impact cascades. Um, Yes, I'm trying to get down to see if there are. Yes, Sherman, exactly. Chaos is the call of the unconscious. And the unconscious is very often the, um, the springboard of creativity, especially in our dreams. Now, it's almost quarter of the hour, so I need to check back in with our hosts to see how much more time we really have in this session, because I would love to keep on engaging with all of you, but I don't want to overrun my time. So, Francisco, how are we doing? Hello, Wendy. You, yeah. you still have 10 minutes more. Oh, 10 minutes more. Great. Yeah. OK, um, let's see. Any more questions? I think I, let's see. Sorry, this is a bit, <laughs> I did get there, Gary, I, I got to the turtles. Oh, and as um, Liam, Liam Mayo pointed out to me, there is actually a song called, It's Turtles All the Way Down. Um, so if you look that up on the internet, it's actually got some very kind of mind-bendingly surreal lyrics, so it kind of fits in as well, and has a really great visual background. Um, so would you accept to be the trickster principal of the Futures Literacy Academy? I would love that. <laughs> actually, what we need to do is work on a global um, and I've, I've been saying this for a couple of years now, I know, so my bad, work on a, a global uh, compilation of tricksters from the actual point of view of those of you who live in all of these vast places that I um, that are represented in my trickster deck. And I apologize for appropriation. That was not, there was no evil intent. It was just that the basic idea of, of trickster gods is so interesting because they are sort of balancing points of chaos and creativity. And each of them, in addition to being kind of an imp of chaos, has a, has a different way of approaching and challenging the status quo. So they actually make kind of nice um, futures facilitation prompts in getting people to think differently or to reframe their thinking of the problem. So is there any country where systems thinking is taught in ki from kindergarten through 12th grade? What a great question, and I don't actually know. But that should certainly be something we think about adding all of you Teach the Future folks who are doing such incredible work spreading curriculum resources. Systems thinking and future studies actually are sister disciplines. They grew up side by side. And if you look at who the founding thinkers were, in both disciplines. There's a lot of crossover, and I'm thinking particularly in this case of Kenneth Boulding, who is not only in on some of the initial dialogues with uh, Ludwig von Bertalanffy, but al also is obviously um, quite famous for, for being one of the founding thinkers in future studies, also wrote um, a book called The Image, and was very focused on images of the future, and was also, um, of course, worked with his wife, Elise, um, who is a giant in her own right, um, to bring Fred Pollock's book um, to uh, 
the English speaking world by translating it, by learning Dutch to translate the image of the future. So this all ties back together, systems thinking, images of the future, Pollock, Prigogine, <laughs> it's all connected, which is actually the lesson of systems thinking is that everything is connected. So I will keep you posted on how my experiment in, in adding the ripples of stomping from one stepping stone to the next of uh, in the Harmon fan work out. Um, we'll potentially be doing a workshop using that in mid-July. So I should be ha have something that I can write up and maybe share versus the Journal of Future Studies um, in August sometime. Any other questions? Anything else? Good point. Yep. Odin himself as a trickster god. And having, of course, those two, um, the, the two, what is it, ravens of, uh, ravens, blackbirds, crows of, what was it, memory and wisdom that sat on his shoulders. And again, this, this ties into the fact that we're, we're sense-making, we sense-make the past by the narratives and the stories we tell and, and these myths. And we need to sense make the future in the same way. And that's that's really to me what visioning is. It's much less than being sort of one component of the teacup, as we would say. Ravens, thought and memory. Thank you. Well, well called. All right. Any last moment questions? This is great, but I I do sort of wish I could see you all face to face. <laughs> um, maybe we need to have a, uh, a special symposium on chaos turtles and thought and memory ravens and everything else to talk through some of this. Oh, that's an interesting concept. Thank you, Merle. Um, the Lyco model through an indigenous first people's lens, there's maybe not turtles all the way down for humanity, maybe monkeys. <laughs> yes, well, yes, it could entirely be mixed species chain of being all the way out to infinity. So we'll have to be, we'll have to celebrate the diversity in the life forms that support uh, the past and the present of the world for us and that will move forward into the future. Businesses do reward linear thinking. Thank you for bringing that up. We need to emphasize that. And that's that's sort of why we have to come up with some of these methods that both make sense to people. And I have never found anyone who doesn't get a futures wheel, if you demonstrate it. Um, but it has to, are these methods have to make sense. They have to be engaging and fun. They have to be specific and come up with sort of workable insights. And, and then, people will begin to see that linear thinking can't be the only type of thinking we do, but that that is a real, um, a real barrier, you're right. I want a chaos turtle shirt too. Actually, I need a good designer to make a better, make a better work of my um, uh, attractors, attractors filling the cone uh, image. I can see it in my head. I just um, am not that good at, at graphics. But yeah, the chaos turtle shirt. Hanuman. Hanuman is one of the cards actually that's in my trickster card deck. So. <laughs> Clearly I'm in the wrong business. I should just go into sort of chaos memorabilia and <laughs> support research that way. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we should create some merchandise. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Well, and you have a, quite a nice logo yourself for the, um, <laughs> I love the branding on the Global Foresight Summit. Thank you. So. Thank you so much, Wendy. Uh, it's been really great. And it's been a pleasure to have you here with us in the Global Foresight Summit. So thank you very much for your time. You're, you're welcome. One last thing I will say is I will put the slide deck such as it is. Again, it's kind of my outline for the essay I'm writing, but I will put the slide deck up on SlideShare. And um, so you will be able to look at it. 
and yeah. it has some of the references. Yeah, the we're notes. creating next week. Uh, uh, oh, excellent! Uploading all the all the recordings to the website, so we can add Fantastic. any link you would like uh, to add for your presentation. Okay, that that'll be really good. And also for those of us that haven't been able to sit in on every single session as much as I wanted to, that's that's great. So the recordings will stay accessible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. will stay accessible. And uh, in your YouTube, in our YouTube channel, uh, are included also the the ones from previous year. So we'll update mm -hmm. the next week the the website with with all the the recording from both years. Okay, so I just want to take a moment then to thank you on behalf of everyone who is teaching future studies at any level, but one of the things that has made it so much easier in the past several years for me to teach the Intro to Future Studies graduate seminar is the fact that there are so many fantastic seminars and discussions and presentations and interviews and conversations and things like FuturePod and Zetopia and the recordings from this conference. It makes a huge difference to teaching to be able to show students really diverse voices in the futures field, and that is so important. So my thanks yeah, for that. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Wendy, and thank you to thank everyone. You. We are back in five minutes with the next session uh, with Superflight Futures with Andrew Potapov and Olga Bokareva. So stay at the website. We'll be back soon. Bye. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. Bye-bye, Francisco. Thank you again. Mm -hmm.